Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. It's a privilege for me to introduce a friend. Dr. Ronald T. Clausen is the executive director of the Rural Home Mission Association, uh, centered in Morton, Illinois. He holds a bachelor's from John Brown University, THM from Dallas Seminary, and a D-Men from Bethel Theological Seminary. He was ordained at Bethany Bible Church in Phoenix, pastored two churches in rural America before becoming the executive director of RHMA. He's written dozens of articles and has two books that he has published, No Little Places, The Untapped Potential of the Small Town Church, and Leading Through Change, Shepherding the Town and Country Church in the New Era. He's a conference speaker, a seminar leader, administrator, mission visionary, visiting professor at a number of schools, including uh, uh, teaching for us here at Dallas, as well as at Bethel in the DMIN programs. He and his wife, Roxy, have one son and two daughters. It's been my privilege to be uh, involved uh, from time to time, watching how God has used him in leadership over these years, and it's a privilege for him to be on our campus. And uh, you'll hear his heart, and you'll hear, share his vision. And would you welcome him, uh, Dr. Ron Clausen to our platform this morning. Well, thank you. John chapter 1, verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. To which Nathanael replies, Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? What in the world is wrong with Nazareth? Philip bullet points Christ's unparalleled resume. We have found the one Moses wrote about, the person the prophets prophesied about. This person is from the lineage of Joseph, which is the kingly lineage. He is the one, the Messiah that we've been waiting for. A standout resume. But all that hits Nathaniel's ears is Nazareth. What's wrong with Nazareth? Well, I think it's pretty simple. Nazareth was normal. It was a small town, like hundreds of others in Palestine. Nothing distinctive about it, not world-class anything, not leading the nation in anything, just an ordinary place, normal. I live just 20 minutes from a town called Normal. (laughs) Normal, Illinois. Perhaps some of you have heard of it. Uh, A few years ago, uh, a young lady from the neighboring town of Oblong took a liking to a young man from from Normal, and uh, soon the engagement announcement appeared in the local newspaper, Oblong woman to marry Normal man. Nazareth was the normal Illinois of Palestine. It was the kind of places where when the tour buses passed through town, nobody bothered to pull up the window shades. It was the kind of place that uh, really didn't have much to celebrate, but once a year it would gather and celebrate anyway, just as most small towns do today. Pumpkin festival, broom corn festival, annual town barbecue, on and on it goes. It was a kind of place that you would tell jokes about. You know, you might be from Nazareth if. (laughs) If you find movie rentals, ammunition, a gallon of milk, and live bait all in the same store. (laughs) 
You might be from Nazareth if the opening day of deer season is recognized as an official church holiday. <laughs> you might be from Nazareth if you check the high school football schedule before you set your wedding date. <laughs> what was wrong with Nazareth? It was normal. You know, it's a good thing that in the grand councils of God's wisdom, I was not put on the committee to plan our Lord's birth, life, and ministry. Because had I been on that committee, I would probably think something like this. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of glory, the creator of all. Surely he should be born in the seat of power. Surely Rome would be where he should enter the world. But then I might think, well, but uh, he's also the divine Logos. He is the wisdom from above. He is truth. He is light. Perhaps he should be born in the city of intellectualism. Maybe Athens. But then come to think about it, he is the high priest. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Maybe he should be born in the seat of religion, perhaps Jerusalem. But I wasn't on the committee that planned our Lord's incarnation, and God in his wisdom decided that his son would enter the world in an unassuming place called Bethlehem and that he would grow up in another humble place called Nazareth. Some of you know that Bethlehem means house of bread. It goes all the way back to David's great-grandpa Boaz, who lived in an area that was surrounded by wheat and barley fields, and after harvesting the grain, they needed a place to process it, and so they built some uh, threshing floors and storage bins, and it became known as Bethlehem, house of bread. So when God entered the world, he came into a little one-hotel agricultural community, not unlike 10,000 communities that dot the countryside of the United States today. Today we would probably call Bethlehem grain elevator, not house of bread, but grain elevator. But you know, Jesus didn't stay in grain elevator. After a trip to Egypt, his family settled in their home in Nazareth. And as the verses that I read a few minutes ago hint at, to be called a Nazarene would be uh, calling someone like maybe a hillbilly or a redneck in today's vernacular. Why, God, did you put Jesus on this earth for probably at least 90% of his time in a place like Nazareth. And doing what? Well, we know that Jesus' father, Joseph, was a tectone, usually translated carpenter. But carpenters back in those days didn't do the kinds of things that we generally associate with carpenters today. They didn't have uh, frame houses back in those days. But a church father does tell us what carpenters did. He says that the bread and butter of a Galilean tectone was ox accessories, yokes, plows, harrows, carts. So Jesus worked from the time that he was a young lad until he was about 30 in a farm implement place. So Jesus was born in a town named House of Bread, or Grain Elevator, and he spent most of his working life in a John Deere dealership. <laughs> K 
Can anything good come out of a place like this? Nathaniel's question naturally leads to another. Would anyone good go to a place like Nazareth? I mean, if you're any good at all, wouldn't you go to some place that isn't quite so ordinary? Isn't Nazareth the kind of place that the less talented go, maybe those with not a lot of ambition? Would anyone with any potential go to Nazareth? Well, one person with endless potential not only was from Nazareth, but he returned to Nazareth to minister there. Luke chapter 4, verse 16 tells us that Christ returned to Nazareth. Verse 14 of Luke 4 says that he was being spirit-led to go back. So this wasn't a guy that just wanted to go back to his hometown, but the Spirit of God was leading the Son of God to go back to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And it says, on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue and he ministered there. Why Nazareth? Do you suppose that maybe God cares for normal people? That maybe God wants to reach not just those on the leading edge, but also those in the heart of the country? Does God just call people today to reach the upwardly mobile, young, culture-shaping, influential professionals and artists? Does he also call people to places like Nazareth? We might think, well, he may call them there. But once a person who is any good gets going with his ministry, they'll move on to the big time. Once Jesus becomes quite the popular preacher, he'll surely move on, won't he? Maybe he'll move on up the road from Nazareth to the city of Sepphoris. Not even mentioned in the Gospels. In fact, about 80% of our Lord's three-year ministry was spent in the small towns and countryside. I want to unpack this a little bit more in the brown bag that follows chapel here this morning. But just for us to get a bit of a glimpse into our Lord's ministry, let me just share a few verses with you. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 says, Jesus went through all the towns and the villages and ministered to the people who were there. Here we find a synopsis of where our Lord ministered. The words here are Kome and Paulus, referring to hamlets so small that they didn't even typically have places of business, and larger small towns that perhaps had a few businesses but were still relatively few in population. Mark chapter 1, verse 38, our Lord speaking to some of his disciples, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby comes, the little hamlets, so I can preach there also. And then he says this, that is why I have come. Here we find somewhat of a purpose statement for our Lord's life. The reason I have come is so that I might preach to normal people like you find in the smallest of towns. Maybe some of us here should embrace a similar life purpose. Perhaps God has put me on earth to minister to normal people people. Do you know what? That's a worthy purpose. How do we know that? Because it's a purpose that was embraced by our Lord. 
Mark chapter 6, verse 56. Here we find remote taken a step further. It says, Christ went to the countryside. The word there is agros. It means farm. So what we see here is that the God of the universe took time to minister one-on-one -on -one to farmers. Luke chapter 13, verse 22 is an interesting verse. Here we find on his way to Jerusalem, Christ stopped in the comes and the polices, and he ministered. And doing so triggers a question, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? There's not the numbers potential out here in, in the country. Come on, Lord, let's quickly move through these little one-horse towns and let's get to the city where the people are. I find it interesting that Christ didn't seem to think that way. My friends, the dear people in the heart of the country, the normal people, need the gospel as much as anyone. They need good Christian workers, good pastors, good churches. They need expository preaching. They need shepherds who will love them and show compassion to them. They need vision. Spiritual need doesn't stop at the city limits. Jesus did some important ministry out in the heart of the country, demonstrating that God cares for people, not just in big places, but also in small. I just want to raise the possibility that some of you, even the best of you, might be called of God might be spirit-led to the heart of the country, even as Christ was spirit-led. Phil received this kind of call. Phil has become somewhat of a hero of mine. He grew up in a, a pretty large church in the city. If I told you which one, all of you would know the church. As a young man, leaders in his church could see some potential in Phil, and they really encouraged him to get involved in ministry, starting him out as you would expect, doing helping, serving kinds of ministries. But, when, but then one day they decided that they would uh, let Phil preach. And they found out this guy can preach. And so they let him preach more and more in this big city church. Well, as time passed, Phil, with the blessing of his church, moved to another city to plant a church there. And within a short time, a huge throng of people was coming, some of them the movers and the shakers, the mayor, the village council, prominent business people. His church was the talk of the city. Soon representatives from other churches came to study what he was doing in his church. In the midst of all of this, Phil thought he heard a call from God. He thought he heard God saying, I want you to go out in the country, in the middle of nowhere, and minister there. Now, I don't know all that happened next, but I could just imagine Phil's a kind of guy that has Nathan Smith's cell number. You know Nathan. He's the leading church growth consultant in the country. Phil calls Nathan and he says, Hey, Nathan, you got time for lunch today? And at lunch, Phil lays it out for Nathan. He says, So right now I'm pastoring the biggest church in the city. We're growing like crazy folks from... All over the country are hearing about what's happening. We're writing books. We're hosting seminars. But I'm thinking that God wants me to go out in the middle of nowhere and minister there. 
And Nathan, and I think actually probably most of us here would say, well, Phil, before you go, maybe you should count noses. I mean, do you realize that this little wide spot in the road, that there are no more people there than there are hogs in Jerusalem? In spite of all the pressure to think otherwise, Phil was convinced that God wanted him to go to this little wide spot in the road that didn't even have a name. Only one person attended his first Bible study, quite a contrast to his city church. But God used that Bible study to draw this person to himself. And Philip baptized that person out there in the middle of nowhere. And afterwards, that person climbed into his chariot and traveled on to Ethiopia. Did you know that the only person in the New Testament who is called evangelist was Philip? He must have been pretty good at it. Yet God took him from a highly populated area to reach just one person out in the country. Apparently, God cares about people, not just in the big places, but also in the, in the small, and calls some of his best people there, like Philip. There are lessons to be learned from Christ and Philip's example. Uh, lessons like individuals are important to God. Why would you take a hugely gifted preacher and evangelist out of a place where there's lots of people to reach and put them in a place where there's only one person to reach? Well, I think it's the same reason why we find Christ stopping and ministering to farmers one-on-one. -on -one. In fact, I just have to wonder, who is the unimportant person to God? A second lesson that we can learn is that isolated contexts are not limiting to God. The Gospels tell us that on several occasions, massive crowds found Christ out in the country. And years later, when the missionaries showed up in Ethiopia to take the gospel there, they were surprised to find widespread Christianity, reportedly because Philip evangelized one person out in the middle of nowhere. Do you suppose that God can mightily work through pastors and other Christian workers who are serving out in the boonies today? Books are being written by small-town pastors. Small-town pastors are teaching in Bible colleges and seminaries. Small-town pastors are traveling the world, ministering all over the place. Small-town pastors are earning doctorates. And all the while, they're being used of God to make a significant difference in the community in which God has called them shepherding people, leading people to Christ, discipling people, pastoring what are often growing churches, and sometimes some even pretty good-sized churches. Isolated contexts are not limiting to God. One of the things that I want to try to show you during the brown bag, those of you who come here in just a few minutes, is that it's very possible that God may give some of us a broader ministry in a place where there are fewer people. Think about that. A third lesson that we might learn from our Lord's and Philip's example, and that is that being where God calls us is more important than being where it looks good. Time and again, God calls his people to go here. But we say, 
God, I want to be over here. Being where God calls us is the best place that we can possibly be, regardless of the demographics. There might be a fruitful ministry awaiting some of you in a place where every church growth study would say, not here. Let me tell you the burden of my heart today. 20 years ago, 70% of rural America claimed to belong to a church. 40% actually showed up on Sunday morning. Today, 34%, about half, belong, and about 25% show up. If we had time, I could name statistics a mile long that tell us about the deteriorating spiritual vitality in rural America. About one-third of our country lives in rural America, up to 100 million people. This is why we need competent, passionate ministry happening there, people who are burdened to reach the heart of the country. Let me try to demonstrate. It's not exact, but I'm going to do the best I can. Let's just say all of you folks over here are from the city. And everybody in this middle section, you're from the city. All you folks over here are from rural America. So what we have here is kind of a microcosm of our country today. Do you know what? We decided that we're going to minister to you folks over here. And you folks, you get ministry as well. But all of you, you can go to hell. That's not what we want to say. And we know that that's not our Lord's heart. If we don't reach the heart of the country, we are writing off about a third of our population. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It can. And it did. Should anyone good go to Nazareth? Well, if we're going to reach the heart of the country, then we must go, even as our Lord did. Let's pray together. Lord, we confess that sometimes we don't look at this world and look at the people of this world quite like you do. I pray that you will help us to have eyes to see places and people as you see them and to have the same kind of heart for these people that you have. I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.